Okay, great. Well, welcome to tonight's webinar, uh, correlating T-scan data to your patient's bite. My name is Jen Cullen. I'm the director of sales for our healthcare team here at TechScan. Uh, we have the uh, esteemed Dr. Robert Kirstein with us tonight. Um, always really valuable to have some time with Dr. Kirstein, um, you know, an expert on, on digital occlusion and on T-scan. Definitely the best person to be teaching this group about how to take the information that you get from T-scan and when you see the marks that are on your teeth, you know, how, how to match up the data, how to look at the data, what are some tips and tricks. And so, you know, we'll have about a 30 minute session and then we will take uh, questions afterwards as well. Um, many of you already know Dr. Robert Kirstein, but um, a key opinion leader for TechScan and uh, has, has the most research out there on the T-scan and on prosthetic complications and all sorts of um, TMJ therapy as well. So uh, welcome, Dr. Kirstein, and thank you so much for your time tonight. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone who's coming to spend time with us after a busy day at the office. I know that it's not easy to uh, set aside time to learn after a busy day, <clears throat> but I'm grateful for the chance to share this information with you. And it is very important information, um, you know, how to actually, um, essentially, as the title says, correlate T-scan data to the articulating paper marks so you know which ones to treat. So I'm going to uh, give you some basic information uh, as to how to uh, address some of the setup in your T-scan, and then I'll show you a number of different examples of how we manipulate the dental arch and um, and how to match the, the articulating paper marks predictably. And uh, then I'll show you a case which it was really important to be able to set up the arch accurately um, uh, to be able to find the right contact to treat. So uh, thank you for your time. And I'll look forward to taking your questions at the end. And thanks to TechScan for hosting this session. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to give you guys this help with the T-scan technology. See if my, there we go. Um, Jen introduced me. Um, I have published over hundred peer reviewed articles on the T-scan and we have five volumes. You can see them on the right uh, about the T-scan, T-scan in orthodontics, T-scan in prosthodontics, T-scan in endodontics, T-scan in prosthodontics, T-scan in perio, T-scan in the digital workflow. There's so many T-scan applications, T-scan in posture. Uh, I am a consultant for TechScan. Uh, I do not receive compensation for sales of any TechScan products, and the opinions expressed in this webinar are mine and not those of TechScan. If uh, any of you have uh, interest in obtaining one, one or either of these sets of books, uh, please let me know and I can help you with that. Uh, we offer a discount uh, with me being the head editor. There's a nice discount if someone's interested in purchasing them. So you can please let me know either by email or through uh, contacting TechScan. So correlating T-scan data, right? This is the, uh, the challenge actually. And to do it effectively, you have to do a number of different things. Uh, and most importantly, the first one is you must set up the T-scan arch to match the patient closely. Now, many of you may enter the central incisor with, and you may take out third molars but that isn't matching the arch accurately or closely. That's just getting you started. And manipulating the data through the course of looking at it on the screen and changing the arch to fit the data is a skill that um, helps correlate uh, predictably. It's essential that you remove missing teeth. Third molars, for sure, they come uh, under the category of missing open if they're totally missing. And removing orthodontic premolars where, or any tooth that's been moved to close the arch um, you want to choose missing closed, and I'll show you examples of these, obviously. And it's very important that you include where the implants are located in your T-scan arch, because you will not uh, activate the implant warning unless you um, have the implants denoted. Very important thing to do, and um, easy to do, just labeling them. And it's also important that I would say to you as T-scan users and T-scan learners, that you first learn to use the T-scan arch to map your contacts to the articulating paper marks. Um, the digital arch is a wonderful advance, but the principles of matching the arch to the patient and matching the paper marks to the data are really learned by using the T-scan arch. And um, uh, 
um, the regular T-scan arch. And then you can transfer that information to the digital arch. And I will show you an example of the digital arch case. Um, and again, the digital arch, even though it sounds like it should closely match the T-scan um, uh, data and the arch overlay, um, it's a skill to line them up. But even after it's lined up, you still have to do things to the digital arch in order for it to match the T-scan arch correctly. So this is typically what we see uh, is that clinicians will not fill in the dental arch. Now here is my file. I've filled in my implants on the right side, but I haven't taken out my third molars. I haven't closed my arch uh, for premolars missing that I had when I was a kid. I had uh, five and 12 extracted. And um, because of that, uh, those things that I didn't do, if I really wanted to treat number three implants, uh, central fossa and distal buccal cusp, I'd actually be treating the wrong place because I don't have, uh, I have three as an implant, but I don't have it as the distal tooth. This is actually tooth number two. And this data belongs in tooth number two. So by working with an empty arch, you'll have a hard time mapping the contacts correctly. It's essential that you set up a, a proper arch. So the way to do that is to use your arch table icon or to do it in the patient file when you enter the uh, initial patient data. And these are the things you want to see. First, you want to see that third molars are grayed out, but that the data of tooth number two is in tooth number two. Even if I grayed out the third molar, but I had data shared between two and three, I would be, and had a big white gap at the distal of two, that wouldn't be useful. 15 also matches closely to the third molar. Here's the dotted line where I've taken out premolars. That's missing closed choice. Missing open choice is what gives you a edential space. Missing closed gives you this hyphenated red line, and you see tooth number six is now next to tooth number four, implant number four, and the same with 11 next to 13. This is essential because let's say I want to treat this contact on 13 central fossa. It's not 13 central fossa if I don't take out the right teeth and space the arch correctly. So this arch is spaced correctly. And uh, again, labeling your implants is the only way to activate an implant warning. So this is the icon to make adjustments within a recording, the, uh, the tooth arch. Now here's an example of where the data is filled in but the arch doesn't match, right? And this is also something common that I see a lot of when I go to different offices and people are learning to use their T-scan. So here I've grayed out the third molars, <clears throat> but tooth number two's data is in tooth number one's gray zone. It's not in tooth number two, which means that this contact on 13 distal marginal ridge is not on 13 distal marginal ridge. And this contact in the third molar is not on the third molar. And this is not on the distal palatal of 15. This would more likely be on the mesiopalatal of 15. So one of the things that happens is when you record, the data comes back and you might see something like this. And we have a very useful tool to compensate for these kinds of errors, which is the central incisor width tool. It's down here at the bottom. And uh, you activate it by clicking on the ruler. And then you can choose the up arrow or the down arrow to shrink the arch or expand the arch. So if I go back to the previous slide where I'm overhanging the third molars, now I activate the central incisor width tool and I increase the central incisor width by clicking up until 9.9. .9. Now I have the correct 15 data in 15 and the correct two data in two, and I'm no longer overlapping the third molars. Now, if I want to adjust this contact between 11 and 13, because it's maybe a, a force outlier, maybe it's too fast, rising, it's actually at the distal marginal ridge of 11, right? And the same with these two contacts and the high force contacts on tooth number two, the central fossa and the distal buccal cusp. So these are essential things to be able to do. So if I go in and mark the teeth of the articulating paper, the marks I'm looking for are the central fossa of two, the most distal buccal mark I can find, this one on the distal marginal ridge of 11, or maybe between 11 and 13, almost exactly there. This would be 13 to the buccal, this would be 15 and 14 shared on the marginal ridge. This would be distal fossa. And those are the things that you can only do with the marks if you set up the dental arch correctly. Central incisor width tool, activate it by hitting the ruler. Okay, now the digital arch, you have to do the same things. And um, uh, you may have a very nice digital arch, but if you don't line up the marginal ridges, if you don't label the implants, you won't get an implant warning. So these are, you know, 
again, the same, the essence of the same thing. Now I'm gonna show you a digital arts that's very um, unique and it's gonna help you use some of the other tools. So let me leave the PowerPoint. Let me stop the share and go into my T-scan, which is, that's my PowerPoint. Here's my T-scan. Okay, this is the counterpart arch of the, oh, let's see, my screen share is loading. Okay, <clears throat> now you can see, excuse me. <clears throat> this is the counterpart arch of the upper digital scan you just saw. And if you look closely at it, you'll see the marginal ridges aren't aligned and the T-scan arch does not match the digital scan and it's actually blocking out the digital scan because of the mismanagement of the T-scan arch. There's also something very interesting about this specific digital scan is it has a molar, a molar, and then it has three premolars here, and then the canine. And so in order to make this arch match properly, we have to do something very unique, which I'm gonna show you. Let's hope I can activate it underneath, there we go. Uh, I need to add a tooth. I need to add a premolar in here. And the way you do that is you put your mouse on the plus minus uh, icon here on the side of the arch where you have to add, which is this side. And then you can drag this, between the teeth you want to add it. So I'm going to put it next between 20 and 21. And you see I have a, a tooth now that says missing open, plus missing open. Now I'm going to call it an implant because that's what it is. And now I have the right numbers of teeth, but I don't have the marginal ridges lined up. So I'm going to do that next. So I'm going to drag the marginal ridges to where they belong so that the T-scan arch will match the digital arch properly. And this is essential because if you take the digital arch off, you now have the correct T-scan arch. Let's see if I can move that one. Yeah. And this one, this one's actually in a pretty good spot. Let's see, this is good. This is good. And move this one. So now I have the arch set up correctly for the data, and I have three implants under overload, and I have every module ridge properly matched. So if I take off the digital arch, now the T-scan arch matches exactly to the data. And so I know this is the distal aspect of 18, and this is the distal buccal cusp of 19, mesial buccal cusp of 19, distal aspect of 20. And if I put the digital arch on, I see the exact proper marginal ridge alignment. So that's a unique situation. That's when you have to add a tooth, but the principles are the same. If I didn't have to add a tooth, I'd still have to line the marginal ridges up correctly. So this feature, the I'll show it to you on the right side because we don't have it. It's there, the plus minus. That allows you to put a tooth in between these numbers and you get a plus sign. Okay, let me go back to the PowerPoint now. Oops. Uh, yes, okay. Okay, so that's this uh, next slide. Let's see the next slide. Yeah, and you can see here, I don't have the extra tooth, right? And the modular ridges don't line up, right? This is all not gonna work. And you saw me correct that, okay? Now, what does it really mean clinically? Well, it means that when you are treating someone, you need to be able to do this kind of thing. Right? You need to be able to see correctly what each mark means. Uh, one of the principles that is often taught in, in, in occlusion is you should make all the articulating paper marks the same size. That doesn't mean they're the same force, as you can see in this, um, in this uh, example. But if I want to refine them further after making them the same size, I know that this one needs a reduction. I know that this one needs a reduction further. I want to get them down to blue, right? blue or light blue. And um, so as a result, if I'm delivering these three crowns, I need to deal with these individual contacts. So if you look carefully, you can see this is the most distal contact. This is one forward. This is the next one forward. So based on the paper marks, this is the most distal contact. There's the next one forward. There's the next one forward. There's the next one forward. So one of the skills that you, you can develop is to work from the most distal contact forward. That's very helpful. Okay? These are just typical examples of how you know, the paper marks uh, can be mapped. 
And it has to do with where they're located. For example, if you look carefully at this, this is distal palatal. It's the most distal palatal place. That's going to be the most distal palatal paper mark. It doesn't mean it's the most distal palatal cusp. It means it's the most distal palatal paper mark that matches up to this force zone. And you can see that same process here as we go forward. You know, you can see, you know, this is the most distal paper mark, and that correlates to that one. This one is more uh, mesial and one tooth up, and you see that's that one. This one is slightly more buccal and more to the mesial. That's that one, right? That's how you begin to judge them. This one would be the blue in between there. And so you have to develop that skill. And one of the most important aspects of that is to first not believe that we understand what the marks mean. The three biggest marks in this picture are the lowest forces, right? And you can see that here. And so a uh, common misconception is that the biggest mark is gonna be the biggest force. The biggest mark is not the biggest force, it's the biggest surface area contact. That doesn't have anything to do with the force. So these are really good correlations that we make by using thin articulating paper. If you use thick articulating paper, you won't be able to do this well either. You need thin articulating paper. This is a really good example I typically teach with. So this was an orthodontic patient who, um, and he finished his bite after orthodontics, it was 65% left, 35% right. And you can see the imbalance in the 3D view. He has the right side was 35%, the left side was 65%. So mapping contacts is, is, this is a really good example. This is the canine, right? That's up there. And then we come back a few contacts and we have some low blues. The mesial of the two six is actually the mesial of 14, our American 14, that's this mark. And if you come a little distal and a little more buccal, that's this green force uh, zone. That's this contact. Then if you go a little lingual and a little distal, you have the next contact, which is the orange force zone. And then if you skip back to the next tooth in line with the orange one, see how these are pretty much in line um, uh, mesiodistally, that's this contact. And then if you come angularly to the buckle on the two seven, that's this contact. And so that's at the essence of how you have to do it. And, um, but don't be fooled by the marks. Here's the biggest mark on the side and it's one of the lowest force contacts. So you can never judge the forces by looking at the paper marks. You can only map them to the forces and then understand that this one's high force and this one's low force, even though they're both big surface area. Don't forget to remove premolars. Here's a prosthetic case, a veneer case that's being inserted, one premolar. Look at the data, one premolar. Same thing on the other side. Very important to be able to do that. If you don't take out your premolars, if you don't take out your third molars and gray them out, you won't have an accurate arch. Very, very important. Uh, here's an example of how misleading the articulating paper marks can be. This is an overdenture that I worked with uh, Dr. Gupta in a training, in office training, a set of overdentures. And what's interesting about them is if you look at the articulating paper marks, this is the left side, and it looks like there's a lot of ink there, more so than the right side. And this is actually very telling. Watch what happens when we play the movie. The right side has much more force. It's 66% to 33.8%. And again, so how you use this information uh, to improve this is you map the colors to the data. And that means setting up the arch accurately. You know, and you can see here's mesial fossa of five, that's the mesial fossa of five, right? Um, you know, this is the distal buckle of between four and five, you know, that's out here somewhere, right? That's where you'd be looking there. So these colors match up a little bit better. This side is a little easier to see. This is the central fossa of five, uh, of 12, I'm sorry. But look at the, the areas around it. So more buccal and mesial is going to be this area. It's more buccal on the T-scan, but it's actually just more mesial. And then more lingual to the, to the high force is this one, right? And then more distal buccal to that is this one, right? And that's what you need to learn to be able to do. Here's a very good example. Um, this is the most mesiobuccal place on 14, right? It's not the most mesiobuccal place in this little square where the T-scan has it. It's the most mesiobuccal force zone. That's going to be the most mesiobuccal contact. This is directly lingual to that, and it's low force. That's this contact, right? That's, that's how you figure out what you're doing. And the other marks, obviously, 
they, they can be artifact, they can be ink smears, they can be, most of them are low force, you know, that, um, you know, are hard to judge, like this is the most distal lingual contact, that's going to be this one here, right? And that's how you do it, right? So this was how it was delivered without the T-scan. And then we went through the process of mapping the contacts over a series of many movies. It took, I'd say, five to seven movies. And then we ended up with something like this. Now, this is not... Um, totally perfect. There's still a couple of high force areas, but look how simultaneous it is. And when you put the two of them together, watch this, when you run them together from the beginning, watch how quickly, even though the, the videos play slowly, but watch how quickly the after treated one with the T-scan, how much faster it becomes simultaneous. Now everything is loading. And on the pre-op movie, the right side is still only together. The center of force is balanced. And you see all the low force contacts are on the screen. Now they're starting to increase in force. And so the timing of this, the, uh, the not only the simultaneity timing, but the occlusion time is much shorter in the post-treatment condition when you know how to map the right contacts to the right carbon paper marks. And there you see this is the first forceful contact to show up. And this whole movie is over, long over. And this one is just beginning. So that kind of correction took uh, about a half an hour to do. And this patient had been in the office a number of times, concerned about his bite, couldn't really pinpoint what was wrong with it, but he came back a number of times. And, and that's the reality of delivering without the T-scan. You know, there's just no way to control the outcome. Okay. These are just a couple of other examples, and then I'll show you a case where we actually create the arch. This is a really interesting case, implant hybrid provisionals. Patient can't hold her teeth together and she lets go and re-squeezes. Watch that again. Here she's biting down, she peeks out, she can't hold her bite, and then she re-squeezes because the teeth don't fit together well. So she's actually stopped from biting and there are six implants under overload. And these, this arch is matched to her, right? Now, how do we use that information? The same way we just talked about, right? Finding the orientation of the high force zones the moderate force zones based on the anatomy, for example, that one's in the middle of the central incisor. There it is in the middle of the central incisor. This one is the most distal buccal contact you can find. That's the most distal buccal contact you can find. There it is. This one is more mesial in the lateral incisor. And these through here, you don't have to touch. So everything distal between here and here, you don't have to touch. That's all of these, right? And then you make uh, another recording after you adjust all of these uneven rises and you do the same process. You remark the teeth and you map the contacts until you adjust it down to balance. This is an interesting comparison. This is the lower provisional. And looking at these contacts, this gives you some orientation. Notice this is not all the way to the distal and, not, and it's more to the buckle. Well, this is not all the way to the distal. There's all the way to the distal where the mouse is. That's this area. And the lingual area is this area where the mouse is. Next one, more mesial, <clears throat> right? And then using the 3D columns, you see how <clears throat> each contact maps to the location of the prosthesis compared to the T-scan data, the T-scan arch. And of course, this is the true challenge seeing something like this and realizing, wow, that's very high force, you know, whereas there's the same smudge and that's much lower force. So you can never tell the difference, even the dark ones, right? This dark one is very forceful on the premolar and this dark one is a little less forceful and this dark one is even less forceful, right? But it could be any or of these, they all could be each other because ink doesn't tell you force. Now going a little to the right side, you see the canine is moderate force. And then there's a really small mark out to the distal buckle, that's pretty moderate force. That's what you actually have to do case after case in order to be successful. The last one I'll show you is one of an excursion. So here the person is moving to the left. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, moving to the left. And they're in the middle of the excursion. And so this is a little bit more challenging to cleanly read, but if you look at each of the arrows, you'll see they point you to the right um, paper mark that corresponds. And the thing about looking at this, the reason I selected this example is because this is the lingual border of the four zones. That's down here on the teeth, right? But it's not here 
on the T-scan data, it's not all the way to the lingual, right? It's, it's, this is the lingual limit of the force application to the teeth. So that's gonna be this area. And the buckle aspect to the force delivery to the teeth is this area. And you see how that matches to these using the color coding. And it's, this is the skill that you learn to develop. And for example, that's the most distal palatal contact I can find. That's the most distal palatal paper mark I can find. This is the most distal buckle paper mark, uh, high force I can find. It's in the most distal buckle aspect of the upper second molar. That's this area, the most distal buckle aspect of the upper second molar. So that's the skill you develop. And these here are low force. And again, this is the lingual limit of the forces. And that's the lingual limit of the whole uh, side of the forces. And you can see that line is the same line as this line. Okay. All right, so let me show you an interesting example. I'll actually go back into the T-scan and show you how we do some of these things um, you know, in a normal, uh, typical case. Um, this patient came to me, referred from her dentist the day that she experienced this problem. She woke up and she could not bite down on the posterior right without having pain. Or maybe she was clenching during the nighttime. It's hard to say, but she couldn't bite on tooth number um, two mostly. She wasn't sure if it was two or three. And her dentist didn't really know what to do, I guess. And he sent her to see me. So she came right over. Uh, you know, she was in another office in Boston. And the interesting thing about her case was that she had a diastema between the premolar and the canine on the right side that was actually about half a tooth. And you can see that here. Okay, so the problem tooth is here uh, in this area. The problem contact is in this area. The question is, which one of these is it? And how am I going to find it? How am I going to modify the arch to accommodate this small space? It's not a full tooth. It's only a, it's only a small tooth, right? So maybe two thirds of a tooth or half a tooth. All right, so let me go back into the T-scheme. Let's put the upper arch on, see if I can. No, I don't want to screen. I don't want to stop my screen sharing. Make sure we can still see it. Why is it paused? It says my screen sharing is paused, so I'm going to. Yeah, uh, we just we don't see the screen right yeah, now. I'm going to reshare. I'm going to reshare. Perfect. That's a better option. And wait for it to load. It it's up. Screen. It looks good. Okay. So this is not the case. This was the case I showed you earlier. This is the case here. Let me put the upper arch on. I can get to the upper arch. There we go. Okay, so let me put this away. So I have a painful tooth number two or three. I have an empty arch. I have a tooth that's half there, right? And I need to find, uh, let's see if I can show it. Yes, can you see the photograph? Does that show? Yes, it does. Okay, so I'm trying to find which one of these paper marks is the one that is the painful contact. And this is a typical problem we face every day. The first step is to create the arch. So I'm gonna open up the arch table. Now I know she's missing third molars bilaterally, so let me put those in, missing open. And missing open. And then she's missing tooth number five, also missing open. That's the sort of half a space. So then the next step is to put the data on the screen. So I'm gonna put all the data on the screen from my original recording. And you can see that I don't have a match, right? This is what I was talking about before. The third, the, the, there's no, shouldn't be any data in the third molars, but there is. There shouldn't be any data in the, in the dental space, but there is. So the first thing I'm gonna do is correct the central incisor width. I'm gonna do that by clicking up. So I open the ruler tool. I'm gonna to increase the arch dimension to try to get the, uh, second molar data all in the second molars bilaterally. And that's just a function of clicking up. And, um, uh, and these things can have to be done even if you measure the central incisor width. You, you may have measured the right central incisor width and get a data set like this because the central incisor width is a, is a great feature, but it doesn't correct your arch for you. It doesn't guarantee you a corrected arch. Okay, so here you can see now I have it sized correctly, but there's an edential space here. So the next key thing is to be able to recognize that there's no force in an edential space. So all I have to do is move this line this way and move this line this way. 
and move this line a little bit this way, and move this line a little bit that way. And maybe I'd even measure tooth number four and get a dimension on that. And that would give me basically the corrected arch. So now I'm gonna save that arch. And then if I go back and play the data, I'm looking for the most forceful contact on tooth number two, basically. So as you can see, it's actually late. Tooth number 15, watch it again. Tooth number 15 doesn't bother the patient. The patient's not complaining about, it. look at 15. It's preceding tooth number two. This is the reality of the occlusion. Just because a person feels something doesn't mean, it's, doesn't mean that it's always primary. And just because a patient doesn't feel something doesn't mean it isn't a real problem, right? But when someone has a, a pain-focused issue, Typically, I would deal with the tooth that's problematic and then talk to them maybe about the rest of their bite subsequently. So watch how two right there comes into play after 15. That's the mesial fossa, not all the way to the buckle, not all the way to the lingual. It's sort of mesial, I'd say mesial fossa. So if I go back to the photograph, right, that's this contact. That's how I found the contact. And it only required one adjustment, right? That's all it required was taking some pressure off of this tooth, of this contact, knowing which contact to choose, as opposed to, well, I think it's that one. I think it's that one. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's that one. Maybe the patient didn't, isn't correct. Maybe she there's no contact that's really problematic because none of them are really dark, right? Of course, that's not the case at all, right? So watch so tooth number <clears throat> two evolve. Right, so all I had to do is go in and treat that occlusion, that one contact. I didn't treat anything else. People always ask me, well, why didn't you treat 15? The answer is when you treat someone who has a problem focused issue, single tooth they can't bite on, uh, you know, a pain that could be from an abscess, it could be from, it could be from an abscess, it could be from a cracked tooth, you have to address that single tooth. And the thing that that does for you as a clinician is it wins their confidence. This person came in from another office. I had never met them until maybe 15 minutes before I'm now going to adjust her bite and, and fix that one contact. And the only reason I could do that with any predictability was because of the T-scan. I was able to find the contact instantaneously. Now watch the end result. And what you'll see is that 2 and 15 are now the same. All right? Watch them rise together. All right? So 2 is not devoid of high force. It's devoid of the contact that was problematic, which was in this area. And what ended up happening was the both sides became more simultaneous and she could load tooth number two despite this area, right? So that's the nature of treating someone's bite. You know, it's you can treat one specific contact if you can find it. And the way I found it was by setting up the arch correctly, mapping the contacts to the paper marks, Taking out, whoops, sorry, taking out the edential spaces, sizing everything correctly. And you can see this is here, and that's it right there. So, Dr. K, we had a question come in. Um, the question is when balancing the occlusion through in incremental reduction, which arch do we reduce first, the upper or lower? It's a very good question. Um, you know, if the patient, the answer is, you can adjust either. Uh, if the patient um, has a problem tooth, it's probably best to try to adjust that problem tooth, unless you can't put pressure on it. For example, the person doesn't really want you adjusting, in this case, tooth number 31, because it's tooth number two that hurts them, right? So that tells you right away that you probably want to deal with the upper arch. But if I had the same problem on the lower arch or a different, different area, I'd be dealing with the lower arch. Um, if you're doing a full mouth occlusal adjustment, it's best to share the reduction on as many teeth as possible so that you share the enamel reductions um, as evenly as possible on the top teeth and the bottom teeth. And the third answer is if you're delivering something such as an upper overdenture um, against natural teeth, unless you warned the patient that you were going to adjust their natural teeth, um, you should stick to the prosthesis and only adjust their opposing teeth, natural teeth, if you warn them at some point in treatment. For example, say they have a roller coaster plane of occlusion. 
as setting up the occlusion for the final restoration, I may have told the patient, we're going to even out your plane of occlusion by reshaping your bottom teeth, and then we'll make your upper teeth more ideal to match them, right? And that would only come from me telling them in advance. I wouldn't be delivering the overdenture the day of delivery and tell them, yeah, we're going to adjust your bottom teeth because, you know, they stick up too far. I would have planned it much further in advance. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So that example is really ideal. Um, I, I would say that's a typical scenario for uh, doing these kinds of things. So um, that's pretty much the presentation. I mean, I have a few more slides, mostly about um, you know in-office training and stuff like that, which I can show you. And okay. Can... Yeah. Why don't you go through and and show those? And what we'll do is we'll open it up for any questions that um, people have. You can write it in the in the Q and A uh, area on on Zoom webinar, which I think is in the bottom um, of your screen. And we'll we'll okay. answer those after you go through those. Oh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. So you can see this was the case, and it was essential to put in the half tooth and to figure out to get to this one contact, right? That was crucial. And that won the patient over. You know, if I was grinding randomly and said, you know, I said, does that feel better? And she would say, no, it's still high. And does that feel, does that seem better? I did it with one correction to one spot, right? That's pretty amazing. And I, as I said, I never met the patient before. If I couldn't set the T-scan up, up accurately, I never would have been able to do it. So as part of this idea that there are many things to learn about how to optimize your ability to use the T-scan, chair-side training is, your, is by far the fastest way to advance your own understanding. And um, it's something that I do a lot of. Um, dentists uh, have me come to their office and teach them chair-side how to record well, how to analyze well, how to adjust well, and the team is involved. And the reason the team is involved is because they need to be on board with using the T-scan uh, because it is, a, um, it is a very powerful device, very helpful to patients. So it's really good for them to see the patient reactions and to see how you know, someone who might've been in four or five times because they couldn't get used to their new you know, implant bridge is now like, wow, that's a lot better. You know? And then the dentist is, seeing how fast they can actually correct something when they understand how to do it. So, and I think this dentist really typifies the experience of the trainee. I kind of, I kind of thought I knew what I was doing with the T-scan, uh, but I was really only using it at its most basic level um, to, to guide me a little bit on um, cases I was struggling with or um, post uh, insertion cases, bigger cases, and and but even then I was just using such a small piece of the equipment. Um, really didn't know what I was doing until um, you know I had you come in and do the in office piece, and um, that's where the real learning took place. And and then I finally started getting real really good results. That's the story. That's a typical response from someone who has in office training. Um, it really advances their knowledge very, very quickly. So I'm happy to take any questions. And as I said, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you tonight and show you some very interesting tips on how to match your carbon paper marks to your T-scan data, which is the essence of using the T-scan. It's really um, uh, something that you must be good at if you want to get really great occlusal outcomes. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. K. There's another um, question. How much do you charge to come into the office? I think, Dr. K, if you can um, if you can address that maybe in an email to, sure. uh, yeah, in, with them or provide your contact information again up on the screen and they can write to you specifically. Yeah, um, the next right, question man. is, is it essential to have an STL file when using the T-scan? No, the answer is no. You do not need to. Um, let me. Yeah, you guys can see this now. Uh, I think I can answer that from a company perspective too. I mean, we we have the the STL feature is is very cool. Um, allows you to be able to align things and and see it on the teeth. But I think that um, you know when you learn how to use T scan and you learn how to understand the the data that T scan provides and how to map it appropriately. You don't really need the STL file. I think it is a very cool feature to, to see it like that.
but it's not necessary. That's correct. And and truth be told, the better you are at understanding how to manipulate the T-scan arch to match the patient, the simpler it is to incorporate using the STL file. It's not, the skills you need are really learned on the T-scan arch. Awesome. So we had another comment. Um, he said, this is a revelation on how to map the bite forces in tooth square. Now I understand how to locate the mark. Huge thanks for this info. I uh, hope this is recorded, awesome. which it is. So yeah, thank you. Um, for your comments. Um, Dr. Christine, as always, thank you for all of your knowledge around the T-scan. Uh, we're going to be providing uh, a number of these sessions for current T-scan users or people that are thinking about adding T-scan on interpretation and uh, all sorts of different topics. So please stay tuned. Um, and Dr. Christine, we, we appreciate all of your uh, insight into this very important topic. So thank you. And thank you for hosting Jen and for, you know, giving the doctors these these opportunities to, to learn you know these key elements of you know effective T scan use and um, I'm I'm glad to participate so thank you. Awesome. I will. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and we're going to end the uh, presentation. So thank you all for joining and uh, please reach out if you have any questions. Dr. Kirstein's information is on the screen or you know how to reach us at TechScan um, at any time as well. So. Yes. Thank you all. Have a good evening.